of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, earnings start for big tech, Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook, all release second quarter report cards. We will break down the results. Plus, Facebook results overshadowed by a new antitrust investigation opened by the U.S. Federal Trade Commission into the company's social media ads and mobile businesses. This after the social network pays a record $5 billion fine to settle privacy concerns. And the proclaimed arrogance of Silicon Valley, Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse has called Facebook's Libra pitch to lawmakers somewhat presumptuous. We'll ask him how the controversy is impacting the broader crypto market. But first to our top story, it is big tech's turn. Facebook, Tesla, Amazon, Alphabet, all reporting second quarter earnings this week. Amazon and Alphabet reported results Thursday. For Alphabet, it was all about sales and regulation. Estimized founder Lee Drogan and Forrester analyst Colin Coburn weighed in. If you look at the way that Google gets revenue, about 85% of revenue at Google is coming from the ad business. And I think, given the competition, again, that, that they're going to be facing, you do not want to be in a, in a spot where you have north of 80% of your revenue coming from, from advertising. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that they're going to place a bigger emphasis on, on the cloud business going forward. Um, how much success are they going to have? I mean, it, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't been able to get out of that third slot, as you said. Um, they're facing massive competition against uh, Microsoft and, and Amazon, who, ha who have had a lot of success and who do put um, significant dollars behind that business. So I think that uh, it'll be something that'll be hard to get out of that third slot. Um, but but still a significant part of their business that they that they will be focusing on going forward. So, so you wonder if acquisitions will be part of the story to beef up the cloud business. They did buy Looker earlier this year, and I did ask Ruth Porat if acquisitions in cloud specifically would make sense. She said, we're open to acquisitions where they make sense. There's a lot we're doing organically, and we're excited about the opportunity. So she, at the same time, she said they're still interested in acquisitions. She also said the organic business is doing well, but it is certainly interesting, given the antitrust scrutiny, Lee, that Google might um, uh, hesitate to do more acquisitions, certainly in the near future. Is that what you'd expect? Actually, I, I think the cloud business is important strategically for this reason. Look at what Microsoft just did with OpenAI, investing a billion dollars uh, in that. I don't even know what you call it. It's not tech. It's, it's a company, but it's kind of a nonprofit. Um, it, and I, I think Google will look at their cloud business in a similar fashion, where the technologies of the future uh, that will be scaled out. Uh, obviously, the cloud business is going to be important for that, and it is in a sense a platform for those new businesses. Um, so while Amazon will continue to push a lot of that cloud business uh, to the bottom line, and as we you know, have seen today, uh, it's incredibly important to the stock price because it um, you know, impacts CSOI uh, so heavily uh, you know, in the bottom line EPS numbers. Uh, for, for Google, I, I don't see it quite that way. I see it actually even more strategic to Google than it may even be to, uh, uh, to Amazon. That was Estimize founder Lee Drogan and Forrester analyst Colin Colburn. As for Amazon's earnings, Wall Street doubled down on the company. On the heels of a record-setting Prime Day, most analysts advise clients to buy into Amazon's earnings report, citing expected strong revenue growth and operating income. I got insight from Andrew Lipsman, analyst for eMarketer from Chicago, after the e-commerce giant reported. AWS is the bigger story here. We saw that decline to 37% growth. Um, first time we saw that dip below 40%, and given how much that contributes to operating profit, I think that is um, maybe potentially the canary in the coal mine. It could also just be a one quarter blip here. Um, but that's something that I think is, is maybe a little bit more concerning to investors as we go forward. Andrew, it's interesting uh, singling out AWS, given that we were just talking earlier about Google's cloud business and how it is still in third place, though the cloud business in general is continuing to grow, and it's certainly not a zero-sum game. But what do you think the slowdown uh, or, or, or the disappointing numbers have to do with? Is it because of competition, or, or is it because of Amazon-specific issues? 
I don't think it's Amazon specific issues so much as it's it's really the competition. I mean, Microsoft's cloud business is up over 60% recently, so we know that that business is on fire. Um, but I think the stalking horse here is Google. I mean, that we don't have a lot of visibility into those numbers, but you do hear that under new leadership, there's some signs of life here. So if that becomes a really strong third player, um, you know, now Amazon's competing with the two giants. I think that that absolutely can eat into that top line going forward. CFO Brian Olsowski said the company did spend more than what they had said they would, $800 million, on the same-day delivery initiative, and that it's been more difficult to execute than expected. I can sort of echo that as a customer. When I've tried same-day delivery on Amazon, it often doesn't work out. Andrew, what are you going to be watching there? Yeah, well, so the top line growth was really driven by uh, the commerce business. And the, usually, I mean, really what I was expecting is to see that investment start to pay off in Q3 and really in Q4. So if we're already seeing an acceleration in Q2, um, we could really be looking ahead to just an explosive Q4 for Amazon as, uh, as because consumers have to develop the habit. Um, and that habit, you know, they're not really feeling the impact of that one day delivery, especially as it continues rolling out. Those habits will get ingrained, you know, in Q3 and then really cement themselves in Q4. So I think that's where we'll really see the upside there. Let's talk about the rest of the year, obviously, going into the holiday quarter. Uh, lots of uh, acceleration is going to be happening. You've got Cyber Monday. You've got Black Friday. You've got all of this competition ratcheting up. How do you expect Amazon to perform relative to the competition in the e-commerce unit in particular? Yeah, so I think there's a few things that really advantage Amazon in Q4, particularly in light of the one-day shipping initiative. So um, I don't know if a lot of folks are, are thinking about this just yet, but we get into a really compressed holiday season. Last year, we had 32 days between Thanksgiving and Christmas. This year, it shrinks to 27 days. So that really advantages someone like Amazon. Um, we always see Amazon increase their share later into the season as consumers don't maybe have the same confidence of getting their deliveries on time with other retailers, but they do with Amazon. So I think uh, that compress season is really going to be to Amazon's advantage. So that's another element of upside in Q4. That was Andrew Lipsman, analyst for eMarketer. Coming up on the best of Bloomberg technology, tech giants visit the White House. The Trump administration hosts some of the biggest U.S. tech companies to talk about fallout from the trade war with China and the ban on Huawei. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. officials said they would send a delegation to China next week, led by U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. This after a high-level meeting in Washington between the Trump administration and CEOs from Google, Broadcom, Cisco, Micron, Intel, and Qualcomm. The meeting was geared toward easing a ban on sales to China's Huawei. Monday, I discussed it with Congressman Ruben Gallego of Arizona's 7th District. I think this is a very dangerous meeting. Huawei is not an independent actor. It is a arm of the Chinese intelligence agency. Um, we cannot trust uh, that us empowering and doing business with Huawei will not end up having negative consequences for us. As a matter of fact, you just read the Washington Post this last uh, weekend. Huawei was working with a shell company in North Korea, supplying them with technology that was explicitly banned uh, through our sanctions regime. Uh, this is why you know we have joined in a bipartisan manner with uh, Congressman Gallagher from Wisconsin to try to make sure that we actually enforce a Huawei ZTE uh, sanctions regime that we think is being effective. And the president should not do one-off trades for farm goods uh, for something that could significantly impact the future uh, of both our country as well as our allies' country in terms of information technology. Now, there are some in the U.S. business community, including many high-level tech CEOs, who will tell you privately they've seen no evidence that Huawei uses its equipment to spy on the U.S. or anyone else. What would you say to them? Well, again, I hope they would just read the, pan, <laughs> the, the, the Panda uh, uh, Shell Corporation that was set up in North Korea to allow Huawei to, to essentially do 
business with North Korean companies that we have sanctioned. So clearly this company, Huawei, is not operating on the up and up. Number two, it is uh, well known that among uh, Chinese companies, it is part of their mandate that they must make anything available and any assets available to the Chinese government. And while I respect a lot of these companies, their goal uh, is to have the highest amount of margins for their corporate shareholders. Uh, as a member of Congress, the most important thing for me is our national security. Uh, and this sends a very bad message also to our allies overseas, where we are trying to convince also not to incorporate Huawei into the national security technology apparatus, uh, because it makes us, uh, as partners, it makes it very difficult for us to actually share information with them. Now, you're referencing a report in the Washington Post that Huawei has partnered with uh, a Chinese state-connected company, Panda, as you say, on projects in North Korea to improve things like, for example, their wireless infrastructure, and has been partnered with this company, according to the Washington Post, for eight years. Now, when the president was asked about this story, he didn't seem particularly alarmed. He said the U.S. will lead on 5G. We'll see what North Korea does. How does this new potential revelation about uh, Huawei in North Korea. Huawei has denied any work in North Korea. How does that change your well, level of objective, objection here? Well, it certainly makes me want to, obviously, clearly, I object even harder about this, and I think uh, other corporations as well as other members of Congress uh, should be worried about this. The fact that the president doesn't seem to understand the problem, the scope, really tells you that uh, we should question his judgment when it comes uh, to his decisions on this very key, uh, important national security issue. Uh, again, I think this president is, it does not understand the full scope of what's happening and what could happen if Huawei should be able to have access uh, to our information technology market as well as our allies uh, and is just trying to be uh, essentially play uh, one sanctions, uh, I'm sorry, uh, one uh, trade war uh, against each other. Uh, we should not be trading uh, access to the 5G market for Huawei uh, for us to go back to what we had pre-trade uh, war, which is basically us being able to sell farm products to uh, China. This is uh, should be separate from this trade war uh, because this will be have long lasting, longer lasting effects to our national security than this temporary trade war we have. Well, and, and that's my next question because you know the leaders of these U.S. companies will say the the blacklisting of Huawei has significantly hurt their bottom line. Some of these companies provide supplies, provide chips, for example, to Huawei smartphones and laptops and consumer products that they say don't have much of a threat to national security. What would you say to those CEOs? Well, they're wrong. Um, it's determination and has been the determination of the U.S. intelligence community as well as Congress as ET and Huawei are uh, dangerous uh, operators. Uh, we have a right as Congress, as a nation, uh, to stop corporations from engaging with other countries and other entities that uh, potentially put our national security apparatus in danger or do not align with our interests. I don't see these companies complaining about us having a sanctions regime against Iran, against other bad actors around the world. Uh, they do not have a right to corporate profit at the at the sake for, uh, of U.S. national security. Uh, that's just how it is, and unfortunately, um, uh, hopefully we in Congress get our way and are able to stop uh, the, the U.S. administration as well as these CEOs from getting their way. So exactly. What would you like to see the Trump administration do? What do you think Congress should do? I think the Trump administration should continue with the sanctions regime they have right now and force them going even stronger. And I think if Congress, uh, and, and hopefully that stays, if the president does not do that, I think Congress, uh, the House and the Senate in a bipartisan manner, should pass uh, a, uh, a new sanctions regime or continue the sanctions regime that exists on Huawei and ZTE to make sure that we're enforcing, uh, you know, some good order and discipline to, again, to continue to protect our national security interests. Now, since I have have you I have to ask you about Iran the president defends withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal and meantime Iran has seized a British flagged oil tanker tensions seem to be escalating so what do you think the US should do about the Iran situation Look, I think that we have to respond to Iran, but in a measured uh, manner with uh, assistance and concurrence with our allies, uh, especially Britain and our European allies. Uh, I think at the same time, we do have to recognize that us uh, leaving the JCPOA without any plan, uh, more as a knee-jerk reaction to anti-Obamanism policy that this president has, has created this situation. Right now, Iran has said they're going to comply with the JCPOA, even though they're not going to receive any of the economic 
economic benefits of sanctions lift, uh, but uh, there are still other areas that we have to keep this president. But the last thing we can we can afford, the last thing that we need is uh, a war in the Middle East. It's not even in our national security interest for us to engage in this type of war, uh, but we have a lot of other uh, tools in the toolbox, I think, to both keep Iran in check and also at the same time try to de-escalate de the situation through, through diplomatic means. And speaking of the tensions here at home, the president under fire for now multiple days for what some have called racist or racially charged language about four uh, Democratic congresswomen, all women of color. Do you believe the president is president's remarks have been racist and that he is stoking racial tension, especially given his response or the lack thereof to supporters at his rallies calling send her back? Yes, of course. Look, this is not the first time that president has used race as a way to uh, engage his base and enrage his base. Let's remember that this president started off his political career basically accusing President Obama of being born in Africa and snuck into this country for some weird crypto reason. Uh, then he, you know, accused a Mexican American judge that was born in Indiana of having uh, dual loyalties. Uh, and so it's not surprising that he describes uh, four American women as uh, essentially not being American and not loving this country uh, and these women are of color he does not describe uh, you know you know, Nancy Pelosi or any other women uh, that are white uh, as being un-American or not loving the country. Uh, he's clearly trying to gin up uh, a base of his support that is racist and does believe in these racist types of uh, uh, theories. That was Congressman Ruben Gallego of Arizona's 7th District from Capitol Hill. Coming up, Tesla sputters. Shares of the electric car maker fell in after hours trading Wednesday after the company pulled back on profit promises in second quarter results. We'll break it down. And later we talk to FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips about Facebook's record $5 billion fine as part of a settlement to put its privacy violations behind it. This is Bloomberg. Tesla posted a worse than expected loss and backtracked from a profit forecast as part of its second quarter report. Cash and deliveries emerged as the biggest challenges to growth, and the company announced its longtime chief technology officer, J.B. Straubel, is stepping down, though staying on as an advisor. I covered the carmaker's challenges with Max Chafkin of Bloomberg Businessweek and Tesla analyst Ben Callow of Robert W. Baird. I think that the $5 billion uh, on the balance sheet is a great number. Um, I think margin is probably why the stock's down, but uh, I think margin is actually, if you go through, through the numbers in detail, is better than expected. Um, and I think forward guidance uh, of being uh, of gap positive uh, on net income is also good as well. Uh, so it, it's kind of an overreaction to the downside, uh, in my opinion. Well, if it's an overreaction, it's a big overreaction. I mean, shares are down 10% right now. Max, th there's a disappointment here on profit. The company turned profitable at the end of last year. That reversed at yeah. the beginning of this year. Elon Musk said the company would become profitable again later this year. It looks like that's not going to happen. So they're, they're still they're still trying for it. Uh, and so it should be said that there's sort of two things going on with Tesla. One is that they've been pushing like crazy for volume. They want to be, you know, a large volume car manufacturer, one of the biggest car manufacturers in the world long term. And this car that they're selling, the Model 3, does not have great margins, it seems. They, they, they push so hard to get the price down to that magic $35,000 uh, base price. Got there. It's, it's come up. Just a tiny bit, um, but but you know the, the margins are super tight on those on those low end cars. And as people buy the cheaper Model Three, they're they're moving away from Tesla's more expensive cars, the uh, Model S and the Model Y. So so there's this pressure on on profit that is at the very least a near term problem. And critics of the company are going to say, well, no, this is a, a long term problem. This is a company that's going to have a really long a hard time getting to profitability. Ben, is it a near or a long term problem? Well, it's not. It's not true that like the Mall Three is. That they actually had better uh, margin quarter over quarter X credits, uh, which is what everyone wants to uh, to look at. And so it's not. It's not true that uh, they're making improvements on the gross margin here. And so uh, I'm not sure what what that statement is. Max. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, the, the the company is not profitable right now. They they obviously like to get profitable. I think I think in the long run, you know, they want to be more efficient in the factory, uh, be more efficient in their operations. That's the message we've been hearing from Elon Musk uh, basically for the last year. And then they want to get this uh, these these new cars out, the Model Y, um, which which could be a huge um, you know a huge boon for the for the company. That's the category of car that that most Americans are buying, and also getting to China. It's the cheaper SUV. What's the status of it? They're they're working Can, on it. Is it, it going to be here next year? Uh, well, you know, I, I think. Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> I don't have any inside information. I, I think it's it's certainly the 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 big effort uh, that Tesla's doing right now on, on top of building a gigafactory in China, which would be huge because the Chinese market is. Uh, you know, the biggest market in the world for electric vehicles. Ben, what's your take on how much China can change the Tesla story as they continue work on this factory, as they're continuing to try to get new models to the market? So uh, we, don't re we don't have any uh, uh, production in our numbers from China uh, this year. I think what's most underestimated about everything here is uh, the brand in China and how how it's kind of become a, a wildfire there and how, how many cars they can sell and I think that's upside and, and just back to you know the cash flow they generated during the quarter uh, you know this is a, a couple hundred million dollars so this idea that they don't make money is completely wrong and the headline needs to change uh, there's five billion dollars in the balance sheet they're not going out of business you have other OEMs that have really hard problems and restructuring problems, and it's not Tesla. It's XYZ German manufacturers that are getting their lunch eaten by Tesla. Now, there's a point there, Max, in that if you talk to people who own Teslas, they love Tesla. They love their cars. They're not focused on the ins and outs of whether or not the company is making money, how many deliveries they're making, what production is, is, is looking like. And so how much does that matter? I, it's huge. I mean, making a good car, if you're a gar car company, is is definitely the most important thing. It's it's more important than anything else. And I think, you know, to, to Ben's point, one thing about the conversation that has changed around Tesla over the last year is, you know, about a year ago, we were there were people out there saying, you know, this company is doomed. You know, they're, they're never going to get to volume production. And and now the, the debate between the bears and the bulls is a different debate. It's it's is Tesla a niche manufacturer? That would be the bear case. And then the bull case is this is a company that's going to be bigger than Toyota, Daimler, and, and so on. And and that is, if you're Elon Musk, that is a good shift in the conversation. You don't you don't have as many people, uh, as many sane people going around um, talking about this thing, you know, collapsing any day or whatever, which which was happening a year ago. Talk about a shift in the conversation. He's been a little bit more uh, restrained on Twitter, let's say, since his settlement with the SEC over how he's communicating with the public on social media. Ben, you know. What's your evaluation of Musk's, Musk's leadership, given some of the hiccups over the last year? So I think people uh, want to invest with Musk. I think that uh, him being more restrained or uh, more quiet is helpful. I think that being cash flow positive is helpful, and having $5 billion bucks on the balance sheet is helpful for the growth managers that haven't been uh, paying attention or can't uh, own this or are avoiding it to come back and buy it at a lower price than uh, whatever a year ago when they weren't where they were with all the callus coming uh, up here. That was Bloomberg Business Week's Max Chafkin and Tesla analyst Ben Callow of Robert W. Baird. Coming up, Facebook marches forward with at least one FTC settlement in its rearview mirror and a new antitrust investigation underway. Facebook posted second quarter results. Shares are up more than 50% this year, as most of Wall Street says fundamentals are still strong. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.
podcast of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Facebook's second quarter results out Wednesday, proving yet again the company can grow both advertising and users while still feeling the heat from regulators worldwide. Just hours after Facebook announced a settlement with the U.S. Federal Trade Commission to end a probe into the company's privacy practices, the social media giant confirmed it is now also being investigated by the FTC on antitrust over its social media ads and mobile apps. This as growth in revenue and daily active users beat estimates, but with its reputation continually under assault, just how? I asked eMarketers Deborah Aho Williamson and Techonomy founder David Kirkpatrick. We have multiple parts of the government investigating Facebook for multiple things. Um, I think one of the most salient things about the settlement and the five billion dollar fine is that Facebook didn't really admit they did anything wrong. I, and I think we really haven't seen them really show a lot of introspection about why all this happened. And I think that is really telling. And unfortunately, the reason it happened is because they have had very poor governance and it has sort of bled out into all kinds of areas of their of their business and it's causing them long term ongoing harm. Well, we're going to talk to one of the commissioners about the details of the settlement and how it'll change Facebook going forward in a moment. Um, but speaking about the numbers, Deborah, with all of these controversies, all of these scandals, all of this scrutiny, how does Facebook seem to keep beating the odds? <laughs> you know what? It's the Teflon company. It really is. Every quarter, I say the same thing. They've been able to grow their revenue, grow their user base, despite mounting challenges. And this quarter, more of the same. It's really, really incredible uh, that Facebook has been able to do this quarter after quarter after quarter. Now, David, I'm going to push back a little on the Teflon thing. Uh, they beat on DAUs, daily active users. They beat on revenue. They came in a little light on monthly active users. But do you really think that all of this is not going to impact the company's long-term reputation and ability to grow? Well, the company's reputation is seriously impaired already. Uh, the ability to grow is a complicated question because as Deborah pointed out you know they just keep raking in the dough they are a brilliantly well-designed advertising platform and especially for smaller businesses there really isn't another place to go where results can be achieved that are similar that's a great thing for this company but long term is it going to affect them it is absolutely going to affect them there's no question about that now uh I would, I would love to jump uh, in. Uh, I absolutely 100%. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I absolutely 100% agree with David on that part of it. I think that the Teflon part of it is their ability to grow their revenue and grow their user base quarter after quarter. Um, I do believe that there's plenty of consumer uh, sentiment issues with Facebook. There's plenty and growing issues with regards to how advertisers feel about Facebook. But the the, th the thing is, is they're still spending there, and people are still using Facebook despite those concerns. Now, earlier today, Zuckerberg did give a town hall at the company. Here's what he had to say about the settlement with the FTC. Take a listen. I believe that companies should be held accountable uh, on privacy. And this is what accountability looks like. Right? As part of this settlement, we have to pay a, a major fine, and there are now very clear rules around how we need to operate on this. And I believe that this is going to help us serve our community better. Now, the FTC could have sued Facebook. That didn't happen. They could have sued Zuckerberg personally. That different didn't happen. They could have curtailed Zuckerberg's professional responsibilities as well. Uh, that happened to a very small extent. But, David, do you think the settlement goes far enough to provoke you know, the introspection that the, you believe is needed as the company continues to grow? Well, it... it I would probably have to say no, because I do not see enough introspection. I mean, if it takes a $5 billion fine to make a company finally start doing what it should have been doing all along with privacy and governance, that's a very bad sign about the culture of that company. Now, I do see many signs of 
gradual reform and consciousness raising and changing behavior. I'm not going to deny the company is definitely in a better place behaviorally than it has been in the past. But the fundamental reasons why all this happened has not been addressed. And I think they really had allowed a culture to emerge which really showed very little concern for some basic interests of their users because they were so thrilled at the amount of money they were making. That's my simple analysis. Now, Deb, this is really a family of companies now. There's Facebook, the blue app, there is Messenger, there is WhatsApp, there is Instagram. How do you see growth at all of these different divisions changing in the future? We, we know that Instagram continues to be a better and better story. We suspect that uh, Facebook proper users, uh, you know, they're getting older, growth is starting to slow down. What do you see? Yeah, absolutely. Instagram remains to be remains a very strong growth engine for Facebook, no question. Um, but that said, according to our forecast, Instagram is still you know well, well under one third of Facebook's total revenue, and will continue to be that way in the next few years. So it's not like growth at Instagram is going to suddenly um, you know balloon this company up to be much even bigger than it already is. The um, main part of revenue, uh, the main driving force for revenue for Facebook remains that that big blue app. Uh, there is still no revenue going into WhatsApp. There is very limited revenue going into Messenger at this point. So uh, really it's all about the blue app and it's all about Instagram at this point with most of the focus on the blue app. That was eMarketers Deborah Aho Williamson and Techonomy founder David Kirkpatrick. Coming up, Facebook faces a new antitrust investigation by the Federal Trade Commission. This after it agrees to pay a record penalty to settle years of privacy violations. We'll talk to FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips next. Plus, Facebook's grilling over its cryptocurrency plan last week on Capitol Hill continues to generate opinions. I sit down with Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse a bit later. This is Bloomberg. Trade Commission Chair Joseph Simons announced what we all knew was coming Wednesday, the $5 billion settlement between the FTC and Facebook for years of privacy violations by the social network. This settlement is the result of an exhaustive investigation, which concluded that Facebook betrayed the trust of its users and deceived them about their ability to control their personal information. Some terms of the deal increase responsibility by the board to protect user data, but little impact to Facebook's lucrative ad business. The agreement was approved by the FTC with a three to two vote. The day the settlement was made public, however, Facebook also announced it is now being investigated by the FTC on antitrust concerns related to social media, ads and mobile. I spoke to FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips, who voted in favor of the latest privacy settlement from Washington. In 2012, Facebook committed to us and to the American people that would take certain steps with respect to privacy. In particular, that it wouldn't misrepresent the kinds of sharing that was going on with app developers and the kinds of control that Facebook users had over data that they gave to Facebook. It also committed to, have a reason, committed to having a reasonable privacy program. But Facebook broke those promises. It also broke a few other promises. We're here today because we looked at what Facebook had done and we wanted to send an important message about adherence to FTC orders and commitments to privacy. So Mark Zuckerberg will now have to personally certify that Facebook is complying with its new privacy policies. How would you like to see his management of the company change? I think above all, what we would like to see is a greater focus at Facebook on privacy. That includes Mr. Zuckerberg, and under the terms of the order, he's going to have to focus more on privacy. But it isn't just about Mark Zuckerberg. What this order requires, beyond the $5 billion fine, 
is attention to privacy at every level of the company. Engineers who are working on projects are going to have to think about the privacy impact of what they do. And if they choose not to protect privacy, they're going to have to explain why. And this goes all the way up to the board of directors. The board is going to have a new privacy committee, which is going to have ultimate authority to oversee privacy at Facebook. So why not find Zuckerberg directly or do more to limit his personal authority? As I said before, this case is not just about Mark Zuckerberg. This case is about Facebook in general. Mark Zuckerberg is a very important person at that company, but he is by no means the only one. We want people up and down the line at Facebook to be focused on privacy. Now, there are a lot of critics out there who say a $5 billion fine is not enough, and secondly, that the structural changes uh, required here are also not enough. Uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Commissioner Rohit Chopra, who voted against the settlement, says it imposes no meaningful changes to the company's structure or financial incentives, which led to these violations. Instead, the order allows Facebook to decide for itself how much information it can harvest from users and what it can do with that information as long as it creates a paper trail. What's your response to that? To me, there are two really important points here. The first is this. What we do at the FTC is law enforcement. And so what we look at in any case is what do the facts show and what are the legal obligations and did the company break the law and we try to remediate the violations of the law. We don't come in and simply tell the company what to do about everything. There are a lot of people in America who have real concern about how Facebook conducts itself. That's a fair conversation. It's a conversation that goes on all the time in homes across the country and critically right now in Congress, which is thinking about privacy legislation. But what Facebook was doing in terms of the you know, ad practices or whatever isn't what this case is about. This case is about the misrepresentations that it made to users about privacy and several other things we've talked about. And critically, that's what we're aiming to remedy. Now, another one of your colleagues who voted against this, uh, Rebecca Slaughter-Kelly, says that the FTC would have done better by suing Facebook and suing Zuckerberg himself. Why not do that? Um, I don't think that's an accurate characterization of the state of play. The remedies that we have achieved, both financial and injunctive, meaning the changes that we're making to Facebook, are very unlikely to have been achieved through a court process. In a normal litigation, what you're weighing is the certainty of less against the chance of more. In this case, what we were facing is a decision between the certainty of more and the uncertainty of getting even less. So now, privacy advocates have advocated for bigger changes to how Facebook tracks is its users and fundamental changes to the advertising revenue business. Do you really think that the changes made here are going to be enough to change Facebook's practices in perpetuity going forward if it's really not, aside from a $5 billion fine, hitting the bottom line? That conversation is a really important one, as I said before, and it's part of the conversation that's going on nationally and in Congress about what, to be what ought to be allowed and what isn't allowed. But that's not what this case is about. This case is about the commitments that Facebook made and its violation of those commitments. And that's what we're focused on with the relief here. That was part of my conversation with FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips. As you can imagine, there was no shortage of opinions on the FTC and Facebook settlement, as well as the new antitrust probe. I got insight from Bloomberg's Ben Brody, former FTC CTO Ashkan Sultani, and Jenny Gebhardt, Associate Director of Research at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I think that the challenge is that the order and the stipulations in the order don't necessarily require Facebook to prioritize privacy over all else. It simply requires that the company be truthful or not be deceptive again in the ways it collects, consumer, collects and uses consumer information. So to your point, they could actually request phone numbers, the same phone numbers they use for two-factor authentication, and use it for targeting. They just couldn't do it under the guise of solely collecting it for two-factor authentication, right? The, the Section 5 authority says 
basically that companies can't lie about, they can't be deceptive about their practices, but nothing prevents them from being transparent about their practices and going ahead and doing so. Now, there are other things coming down the pike that Facebook has already said it's going to do, like merge the back end of WhatsApp, Messenger, and, <coughs> and, and, and Instagram. You know, Jenny, I know you believe this is deeply problematic, you know, what other major privacy issues do you see down the road that have already been basically teed up? Yeah, I mean, one huge one with WhatsApp, Instagram, and Messenger merging um, is the issue of merging those three identities for people, your WhatsApp number, your Facebook authentic name, and your Instagram pseudonym or handle. Um, Facebook has promised that that will be opt-in when it rolls out, um, but Facebook has a history of reneging on privacy commitments. I think looking at their privacy policy alone over the past 10 years is a study in the art of the bait and switch. So we'd like to see really some kind of limitation that Facebook will stick to its word, that if it says it's going to be opt-in, it's going to remain that way. And it's not going to be the case that in two to three years, users are surprised by a new privacy policy that says you have to merge all these identities to continue using these services, something like that. Now, Ben, quickly, what do we know about the FTC antitrust investigation into Facebook that Facebook just announced and Commissioner Phillips just confirmed? Uh, yeah, absolutely. We don't know a lot about it, and I sense that Commissioner Phillips may not know a lot about it either. Uh, it's early days, but when the FTC starts an investigation like this, what they basically have is a credible reason to believe that there may be a violation of the antitrust laws, that there may be consumer harm that they need to look into. So that is what uh, this investigation that Facebook has disclosed and the FTC has now confirmed. That is basically what that means. That's about all we know right now. We also know uh, that FTC talks to European regulators, so they may be taking some cues there, but often they want to go their own way. So it really remains to be seen what's going to happen. So what do you, as, as someone who worked at the FTC for many years, what, what's happening right now? I mean, so it's quite likely that the commissioners don't yet know if it's at the staff level, right? Uh -huh. They were probably briefed on it, um, but they, don't, they probably don't know the details, uh -huh. and that's by design, right? They're supposed to keep a wall uh -huh. between investigation. I do know, like, the practice you just described in antitrust terms would be bundling, right? Requiring that accounts, if from one account, be forced to use a different product, right? So if you have a WhatsApp account, you would be forced to use a Facebook, uh, Facebook account. Um, that would be bundling, and so there's a number of factors that the FTC could be looking at with regards to the antitrust um, uh, investigation. I think the most critical piece, which is I think what, when you asked the commissioner himself, is that to what degree are the the different, so there's, the FTC has multiple components. There's the Bureau of Consumer Protection and the Bureau of Competition and the Bureau of Economics. Mm -hmm. the, Consumer Protection and uh, uh, Competition Bureaus operate independently, right? And so um, the question will be, to what degree are they overlapping and sharing information from the Consumer Protection investigation with the competition uh, investigation? Bloomberg's Ben Brody, former FTC CTO, Ashkan Sultani, and Jenny Gephardt, Associate Director of Research at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Coming up, Facebook's Libra got little love from lawmakers on Capitol Hill last week, but will the crypto community welcome the new digital money? I asked Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse. This is Bloomberg. Capitol Hill hearings on Libra last week continued to roil the crypto market as most all cryptocurrencies were down except for Ripple. U.S. lawmakers spent two days last week grilling Facebook's David Marcus, co-creator of the proposed stablecoin dubbed Libra, to get insight on how Libra could shape the digital money space. On Monday, I spoke with Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple, and Bloomberg Tech social media reporter Kurt Wagner. I think they've taken a very bold, ambitious effort, which is part of what makes Silicon Valley great, right? You know, we have these incredible entrepreneurs who think big, think outside the box. I think it was a little bit, maybe more than just ambitious, maybe a little bit arrogant to take the approach of, hey, we're going to build, the, the white paper articulates a new currency. I think the US dollar actually works pretty well. One of the things I tweeted last week is, is a moment where I agree with the president on this. Like, we don't need a new fiat currency, the G20, the dollar, the pound, the yen. There might be some you know, smaller markets where uh, the, the Argentinian peso, that might make sense. But I think that's a, a longer tail. And I just think the way they rolled it out, as we saw, you know, there's a lot of turbulence, a lot of headwinds. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see that plays out. Now, Kurt, you know, we talked a lot last week about the level of skepticism and mm -hmm. ire, you know, one lawmaker comparing it to 9-11 and the level of danger. Right. Uh, but what's happening now? Now that this hearing has happened, what's next? Well, that's up to kind of Facebook to figure out because they've announced, hey, we have this group of 
uh, 28 different partners um, that are going to be part of the Libra Association that actually oversees this currency. But right now, there's no charter for that organization. There's no uh, payments that have been made. And so at this point, it's just kind of a, a continue to talk about regulation, but also on Facebook side, they need to get their team together here to actually get this moving forward because right now it's just a white paper. It's it's an idea, but it's not actually something that's you know uh, tangible. Now, Brad, do you think that regulators will let Libra happen in the U.S.? Look, I think. Facebook had had conversations with regulators before they announced the white paper, and, and some of those regulators I know had expressed concerns, and I don't think Facebook really did enough to mitigate that and to really make them feel comfortable. It's very important to both the U.S. government and governments around the world that rate financial regulation matters. Know your customer and anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist financing. These are important foundational pieces of our financial system, and we need to make sure that the, the future constructs keep those in mind. And again, I, I think that the only danger that's happening right now is that legitimate projects working on you taking advantage of crypto to solve real problems get caught in the crossfire a little bit. Because you're seeing, you know, that even the president came out and tweeted, you know, I don't like cryptocurrencies. Well, that's a little like saying I don't like an internet company in 1997. There's <laughs> lots of different shapes and sizes. What Ripple's obviously doing is with banks, with regulators, it's almost the antithesis of how Libra is really approaching the effort. So there are some who said that if Libra succeeded, that wouldn't be good for Ripple. That would reduce Ripple's opportunities. Is there truth to that? No, actually, I look at Libra. I mean, they, Facebook is a consumer company, and you know, when they think about the problem they're solving, I think it's very much a consumer-oriented problem. What Ripple's doing is at the institutional level. We're connecting banks. If anything, and I said this publicly, we had one of the best weeks we've had in our history the week Libra was announced because it's a call to action for banks. David Marcus came out and said, hey, this is the end of Western Union. Well, that's an assault on the financial sector, and you know, we've taken the opposite approach. Let's work with the system because the regulations are enforced at that point. And again, I just think we can't paint this one big broad brush, particularly at the U.S. government level, where you have technologies like Bitcoin and Ether that are controlled by Chinese miners. You work with a lot of banks. What do they think of the Libra Association? And would you ever work with the Libra Association? Well, I think what you saw happen, and Kurt kind of alluded to this, a lot of people signed up, the 28 members signed up kind of with the, there's no, it was just an LOI. There was no money changing hands. There was no hard commitment. And so they wanted to have a seat at the table and hear what was going on. I even think it'll be interesting to see, do the 28 that have signed up continue to participate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's too early to tell. But I do think it was very noteworthy that there were weren't any banks and financial institutions as a part of that 28. Because again, I think it's kind of an assault on that system, which is ambitious to say the least. Now, Kurt, there have been reports that there's been skepticism among the partners who've already yep. signed on to this project. What are we hearing about that, especially since last yeah. year? Yeah, well, they're not saying anything publicly, and I think that's one of the biggest concerns, quite frankly, is that Facebook is really out here taking the beating a little bit by itself for a project that they claim is is a, you know, they are a co-founder with many other companies. So if I'm Facebook, I'm sitting here going, hey, are you guys in or not? Because we, we could use a little support out there. Uh, but with the banks, you know, Bloomberg has reported that Facebook and others in the association are out talking to banks right now. They want them to be part of those members because I think it does add a level of legitimacy to this whole effort if they can have banking partners on board. Um, but right now, I think if you're Facebook, the biggest challenge is just getting those people to actually say something publicly so uh, they put their name behind what they're doing. Um, so Brad, on another topic, Bank of America, there have been reports that uh, Bank of America has taken out a patent that suggests it's using the Ripple led ledger for its currency transactions. Can you comment on that? I saw that. <laughs> Can you confirm or kill the speculation? I can neither confirm nor kill. <laughs> like we are, I think, widely known to be working with a lot of banks around the world, and certainly some of the largest banks already are in the world are customers of ours today, uh, and we'll continue to work with big banks around the world. And uh, I, I too was surprised by uh, that patent application because we're, we're, we have not announced anything. That does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Tune in every day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And we're live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.